Welcome, um, Osman al -Bayrak. Hello, Mr. Ismail, and thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, hello to all the listeners and viewers once again. Uh, I would like to thank the Mosaic Foundation for allowing me to make a presentation concerning the minorities in Turkey, especially during the transformation uh, period from an empire to a national state. Uh, when Mr. Ismail uh, approached me and told me about this project, I was, of course, very excited and, of course, had some concerns how I should and must approach this topic. Um, because the issue of minorities, uh, be it ethnic or religious minorities in Turkey, is a sensitive and a controversial issue in Turkey. In present-day Turkey, minorities, unfortunately, uh, do not enjoy the same rights that are taken for granted here in Germany or in the United States or in the several other EU member states. Um, today, the beginning of the history of the modern Turkey is usually considered to be the founding of the Turkish Republic by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the first president, uh, in 1923. However, the most important and transiting changes regarding social and economic structures or legal system, uh, also the national uh, identification had already taken place before that in the late Ottoman period. Uh, in my presentation today, I will try to give you an overview. First, of course, I will address the historical perspective. Uh, since the, uh, since today's Turkey is the successor state of the Ottoman Empire and the foundation of this nation state, uh, Turkey was not an easy process and that the Ottoman heritage economically, politically or culturally has uh, positive and negative impacts even today. Uh, and furthermore, without the Treaty of Lausanne, which is to be seen as the founding document of the modern Turkey, one cannot and must not answer the minority questions in Turkey. Uh, in my presentation, I will present a few details of this treaty and explain how this is reflected in the policy of the Turkish government since on. And lastly, I will focus on the reform attempts uh, of the Turkish governments and explain why in most cases they are not sufficient and uh, doomed to fail actually. Uh, here you can see a map of the Ottoman Empire at its zenith. Uh, at its peak the Ottoman Empire stretched across a geography where more than 30 states are located today. Um, in the Ottoman capital, Istanbul, or in the big cities like Izmir, Thessaloniki, Sarajevo, uh, Damascus, Baghdad, or Jerusalem, uh, one could see different cultures and religions living and flourishing side by side and with, uh, with each other. Uh, during the Ottoman Empire, uh, in, its, uh, in its more than 600 year existence the, uh, in the Ottoman Empire, the empire and the government, the ruling elite of the empire, developed uh, a multi-confessional entity uh, into a multi-confessional entity in which the millet system, uh, non-Muslim uh, population system, regulated the uh, status of uh, the non-Muslim religious communities uh, based on the Islamic law. This system ended then in 1839 uh, uh, with the Tanzimat regulation, which provided the Ottoman citizenship for all subjects of the Sultan. Uh, of course, after the French Revolution, uh, national movements also began to take root in the Ottoman Empire, which of course was a powder keg for a multi-ethnic empire like the Ottoman Empire. In the 19th century, major European powers, uh, major European powers saw in the increasingly weak Ottoman Empire an opportunity to expand their colonization policies. The British Empire on one side, the Chinese Russia and the France increasingly 
try to present themselves as protectors of the ethnic and religious minorities to expand their political and strategic influence in the Ottoman area. Um, it, it is very interesting. The first to, uh, who resisted the Ottoman rule were actually the Serbs uh, in 1804, uh, but the first who won their independence were the Greeks in 1829. Uh, concerning the Armenians, the first Armenian uprising is dated 1862. Uh, till then, uh, the Armenians actually enjoyed uh, and were considered as Mileti Sadika, uh, which we can translate into trusted minority. Uh, but uh, after this uprising in 1862, the uh, they, less, they lost more and more of their social position from that year on. When we look at the Arabian, I'm going very fastly uh, this uh, historical period, so excuse me, but if you have uh, questions, please uh, write them. Uh, when, uh, when we look at the Arabian Peninsula compared to the Balkans and the Eastern Anatolia, the uprisings began very late at the beginning of the 20th century uh, and were divided after the First World War between England and France uh, after the First World War. Of course, the Ottoman uh, sultans and the governments uh, had to respond to these threats. What they did was, first of all, introduce the citizenship to all its subjects, uh, which I mentioned above. Uh, but when this failed, the Sultan, who was also the, uh, the Caliph, tried to keep the empire and the population together through the Caliphate by emphasizing uh, the common religion, which was, of course, Sunni Islam. Uh, what actually worked to some aspects, but then the, after uh, the date of 1908, uh, the young Turks and the even stronger getting Ittak and Teraki, uh, the Committee of Progress and Union, with its notorious leaders uh, like Enver Pasha or Talat Pasha or Jamal Pasha, introduced, it, introduced the national consciousness, the Turkishness. The salvation of the Ottoman Empire was uh, sought uh, in the original identity of the Ottomans, uh, the Turks. What, of course, uh, was counterproductive for a multi-ethnic empire and accelerated the disintegration of the empire, and uh, which, of course, uh, would only mean that after the World War I, uh, the Ottoman Empire would have an end. We have to see it so that during this time, during the uh, War of Liberation as well, and after the War of Liberation, the Republic of Turkey, which is the successor state of the Ottoman Empire, was uh, uh, built uh, on an area actually uh, of the Ottoman Empire, who lost 85% uh, of its territories and 75% uh, of its population. Uh, a power that once ruled three continents almost and taxed lucrative trade routes was no more. So there is a trauma of the Turkish population which were pressed, uh, which were pushed into central Anatolia in that time. Uh, and uh, since uh, the victorious powers were foreign, uh, since the foreign powers also besieged Anatolia, there was a threat, there was an assumption of threat coming from these uh, uh, foreign powers. So everything what, which was not uh, Muslim or which was not Turkish was considered as a threat to the very existence of the Sunni, Muslim and Turkic uh, nation. So um, these states, the victorious states after the First World War, uh, of course, uh, had hoped uh, that the implementation of the uh, peace agreement in Sev uh, was, is going to be, was going to be implemented from the Turkish side, 
but which uh, actually it didn't uh, happen. So the liberation war uh, led by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk began uh, during that time. And we are in this time uh, between 1919 and 1922, uh, it was very, it, the, the question of minorities was, was actually very interesting because uh, normally Mustafa Kemal Atatürk and his uh, friends didn't have any problems with minorities generally. Uh, but uh, it is very interesting uh, to see that the minority representatives weren't invited into, for example, uh, in the cornerstone meetings of the uh, liberation war, uh, such as the Erzurum Congress or the Sivas Congress, uh, they were left out. Um, another thing is uh, the rhetoric with, which was changing during that time. For example, at the beginning uh, of the uh, liberation war in uh, 1919 uh, and at the beginning of 1920, uh, a journalist asked Mustafa Kemal uh, about the massacres of uh, 1915. I call it here massacres, but further I'm going to call it genocide because the uh, journalist asked as massacres. And Atatürk responded then in 1919 uh, that the people, that, uh, that the politicians and the people who and officials who are responsible for these, for these atrocities and these massacres will be brought to justice and uh, they will not hold any political position in the future Turkey. But uh, after uh, the agreement between uh, Turkey and Armenia, then back Armenia in 1920 in December, uh, the, the agreement uh, of Gümrü, Alexander Poli uh, in Russian, in December 2020, uh, in 1920, uh, the Armenian government gave up their demands concerning justice for the victims. And further on, Ataturk and his fellow statesmen uh, chose to ignore and deny the genocide of the Armenians. And this became then the denying, uh, the denial of uh, the genocide became then a state policy. And uh, through the history since then uh, till today, in, you you can't find any text or any passage uh, of the of the Armenian genocide in school books as well. Uh, I got my education in Turkey. Uh, we have got uh, Atatürk's lessons in Turkey, the, the revolutions and uh, uh, Atatürk's uh, gainings as a lesson, as a uh, subject in the lessons. And you never find any uh, of this historical truth pointing that uh, 1915, there, uh, that there was a genocide to Armenians and that the Ottoman Empire, during the Ottoman Empire, the young Turks uh, made this genocide uh, actually, um, unfortunately. So, and we, when we come after the liberation war, the, the, uh, as I mentioned before, the Treaty of Loza uh, is actually the main uh, text where the, uh, where the uh, situation of the minorities are, are uh, dealt in. Uh, and when we look at uh, when we look at the negotiations uh, of Lausanne, we see that the old debts of the uh, Ottoman Empire about the Ottoman economic capitulations, or uh, about the recognition of borders of Turkey at the time not a republic, but uh, after that, uh, 1923 a republic. Uh, and also uh, the right of minorities are, uh, were uh, debated uh, in, in uh, Lausanne. Um, what the main lack of Lausanne is that the Western powers uh, who 
actually brought the Turkish government, the Ankara government also on the table, uh, they were not so keen to uh, step up for the rights of the minorities as they were two, uh, three years ago in uh, SEV, in the SEV agreement. Uh, because uh, when we look at the structure of the Treaty of SEV, the minority issue is not a, a topic in itself, uh, but it is a topic discussed under the uh, main head topic of political affairs. So we see that uh, that the main powers, the victorious powers, weren't so much interested anymore to uh, get Turkey uh, to, uh, uh, to stand up as strongly for the right, rights of minorities as they were before. Uh, and one another problem was, of course, that the Muslim minorities which were living in Turkey, such as the Kurdish population or the Alevites were also not uh, counted as minorities. The treaty in itself mentions actually just only non-Muslim minorities as minorities and refers to the traditionally largest three minorities, the Jews, the Armenians and the Greeks. Uh, but um, since day one, actually, uh, Turkey has not only denied the larger minorities uh, to use their rights, but also has deliberately ignored the rights of the smaller non-Muslim uh, Assyrians, Chaldeans, or Yezidis. Uh, and as I mentioned before, also the Alevis or the Kurds also do not uh, have any rights according to this uh, treaty. How uh, this happened is that uh, actually, the uh, victorious powers insisted on the ethnic, linguistic, and religious uh, differentiation in the definition of minorities. But the Ankara delegation, the Ankara government, succeeded uh, in making them con uh, concessions uh, by just simply arguing that uh, traditionally uh, in the Ottoman Empire and for several centuries in Anatolia, the only non-Muslims were considered as minorities and not the uh, uh, Muslims with, uh, and not the Muslims or non-Turkic uh, speaking uh, minorities, Muslim minorities. So, uh, now going to some uh, sp uh, to the minorities uh, in Turkey, the largest group of uh, Turkish Jews uh, were the Sephardites, actually, who came who immigrated from Spain and Portugal uh, uh, after the Edict of Alhambra in four, uh, in fourteen. Uh, 92, uh, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, then the second uh, Bayezid, published a degree welcoming the Jews. Uh, there were, of course, uh, some Ashkenazis in Turkey who have their origins in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, but these are much smaller numbers. And there are also some, uh, back in Ottoman time, there were also some Jews. Uh, who were uh, there since the Byzantine times. Uh, today, about 17 to 18,000 uh, Turkish citizens with uh, Jewish beliefs, uh, with, with Jewish religions are living in uh, Turkey. This number was actually more in 2010. It was approximately 26,000. And uh, before the establishment of Israel in, in 1984, uh, in 1948, uh, the number was uh, approximately more than 120,000. Uh, the problem uh, in today's Turkey is actually anti-Semitism. Uh, when we look at the current state of affairs concerning anti-Semitism, we see uh, a rise in hate speech and discrimination. According to the study uh, by Hiran Ting Foundation in Turkey, 2017, uh, 1,251 out of uh, 5,300 articles were rated as part of hate speech 
were anti uh, uh, which were actually anti-Semitic. Uh, in the following year, 2018, approximately 1,200 articles uh, appeared, uh, which were actually categorized as anti-Semitic. And uh, here is a, a beautiful uh, church of Holy Cross on the uh, on the island uh, on the one lake in uh, Akdamar Island, and it was newly restored uh, by the Turkish government by the now ruling party, uh, the AKP, uh, the Justice and Development Party. And here is also uh, the Sumela Monastery in Trabzon. Uh, unfortunately, uh, within the borders of today's Turkey, only a fraction of Christian population that was actually resident on this territory during the Ottoman Empire still lives here. Uh, when we count the almost one and a half Armenians who were victims of the genocide, uh, during the young Turkish, uh, young Turks and uh, government between 1915 and 1917. And uh, as a result of the Greek, uh, with the Greek, uh, with the Greek uh, government the agreement in 1923, which actually foresaw an exchange of the Muslim and Christian population of both sides, approximately uh, 1.2 million Christians uh went to greece and had to leave turkey uh, an approximate uh, three million christians went just only during that period of time uh, to uh, to uh, greece and were actually uh, killed uh, so unfortunately just only a fractal uh, fraction of christian population is living now in Turkey. Uh, as we see from the numbers, uh, when we look at it, the Roman Co Catholic Church has only 25, uh, 21,000 uh, members registered in the church registers. The Eastern Catholic Churches, among them the Armenian Catholic Church, the Chaldean Church, or the Syriac Catholic Church uh, have 5,000 members. Uh, mostly the population of Christians now living in Turkey are the Orthodox churches with their members, uh, of course. And what the main problem for the Christian population in Turkey is actually, is that uh, the lack of uh, legal representation. Uh, with the establishment of the Turkish Republic, uh, the legal representation of both actually Muslim and non-Muslim religious communities uh, have been abolished back then. Um, especially the rights of non-Muslim uh, which was actually regulated by the Treaty of Lausanne and granted uh, Turkey national independence. Uh, the treaty does not distinguish between uh, individual non-Muslim minorities. Uh, that's the problem. and. Another problem is that uh, the legal uh, the legal conception, uh, firstly, the group of Armenians and the Greeks can be distinguished among the Christian minorities who are recognized by the Tur uh, by Turkey as non-Muslim minorities and who consequently have in particular the right to maintain religious foundation and minority schools. Uh, but unfortunately, this right doesn't pass to other uh, Christian minorities. And another main problem is that uh, since the Christian churches in Turkey do not have legal representations uh, with regard to the functioning of the corresponding institutions, uh, as the leading ministers have only limited possibilities to intervene uh, in the institutions assigned to the uh, assigned to the church, thus, uh, from a purely legal point of view, there is no relationship between the patriarchs, and uh, on the other hand, uh, their parishes and educational or welfare institution. On the other hand, uh, that's the main uh, problem. 
till today, since the property of the church uh, as a foundation are solely subject to the supervision of the Turkish General uh, Directorate of Foundation uh, State Apparat uh, and not the church itself or the uh, uh, leaders of the church. So, and before I went on to the Kurds, uh, I would like to say um, something about the Armenian issue, about the Armenian genocide. Uh, it is very difficult these days. We had uh, two days ago uh, from Germany on two days ago, um, the recognition of the, uh, of the President Biden's, uh, of the happenings of the, the Armenian genocide. Uh, it is a delayed recognition, of course, and to speak about uh, the Armenian genocide in Turkey is very difficult uh, because if you are going to speak uh, about the Armenian genocide in Turkey, you have to put a phrase uh, in front of the wording Armenian genocide. And this phrase is so-called Armenian genocide or alleged Armenian genocide in Turkey. If you say it that it was an Armenian, that it was a genocide, uh, and you you are out of the box of the uh, of the Turkish society, uh, you are labeled as traitor. Unfortunately, in Turkey, the problem with um, recognition with the recognition of the of the Armenian genocide from foreign leaders uh, is always uh, linked with. Uh, interference uh, of uh, and with political uh, background, with political uh, thinking in Turkey. Yes. So, unfortunately, uh, although it had to be done, this announcement of uh, President Biden that it is a genocide, uh, it is late, 106 years, uh, but it is correct. The effect on the Turkish society will uh, that uh, the Turkish society uh, and the deniers of the Armenian genocide will just only consolidate uh, co uh, their ranks uh, between each other. And they will see it as an, uh, unfortunately, as an interference. So it would be more wiser if uh, this, these uh, foreign leaders do approach the Turkish society and try to uh, get the people uh, to process the history, to reprocess the history, to accept, to face the history, to uh, not to denying it, to face the history. That's more important than making some announcement, actually, I think. Uh, would be also more uh, productive uh, in that issue, unfortunately. Um, going on to the Kurds, uh, approximately 30 million Kurds are living uh, in the green area. Uh, as you see, the Kurds are divided in Syria, uh, they are living in Iraq, they are living in Iran, but the main population of Kurds is living in uh, Turkey. Uh, Kurds, the Kurdish population in Turkey uh, is unfortunately uh, was during the time of state building, nation building uh, period in Turkey after the uh, proclamation of the Republic. Uh, they were denied of their cultural rights, of their ethnical rights and of their just for example, you couldn't speak in Kurdish for a long time uh, after uh, in Turkey. It was a law. It was just only allowed uh, in the 1990s. Um, educational center, uh, Kurdish education, is still a problematic. Although it's allowed, uh, there are institutions which teach Kurdish, uh, but. Um, especially after the uh, coup attempt, uh, after the coup in the military coup in 1980s. Uh, I know it from some books uh, of uh, state employment, which were, uh, which we had to read. Uh, there were some um, 
I cannot call it uh, scientific approaches to, towards Kurds because uh, Kurds were listed uh, or uh, labeled as uh, Turks who are living in the mountains and uh, in snowy mountains. And uh, when you step on snow in Turkey, in Turkish, it makes the sound uh, of Kurt. So, uh, so there was a link that Kurt, Kurt, Kurt that the Turks who are living actually in the mountain areas are called Kurds because they walk on uh, snow, which makes the sound of Kurt. So that's, that's, uh, it's not sarcastic. Unfortunately, it's the bitter truth uh, in Turkey uh, concerning the Kurdish identity. Uh, so, uh, and um, the Kurds actually, the conflict now in Turkey with the Kurds is actually the 29th uh, uprising of the Kurdish uh, nation uh, since the Ottoman Empire. And after uh, the War of Liberation was actually uh, ended with the agreement uh, between Turkey and the victorious states and in Lausanne, we see that Turkey focused on a one nation uh, building uh, strategy. And since, um, since the Kurds were actually uh, first willing to uh, build this new republic with the Turkish majority, but they were promised to have more uh, ethnical rights and Ataturk didn't give them, of course, these ethnic, uh, ethnical rights and cultural rights. So the uprisings from the Kurds started with the Shea, with the Shea side uprising in 1925 the Ararat Ar uprising in 1930, and uh, another massacre, and also a genocide actually to the mostly Alevites and Kurds uh, in Dersim is 1938 uh, uh, Dersim uprising, uh, which actually was the longest uh, uprising uh, from time. Uh, for the time being. And uh, after that, uh, approximately 60 years, uh, 50 years, sorry, 50 years, no major uprising came in uh, into the agenda of the Turkish society uh, until the uh, first years of 1980s after the coup attempt, uh, after the coup in the military coup in 1980s, because uh, Kurdish population, especially in Diyarbakir and in, in the southeast of Turkey, were tortured, uh, villages were burned down, and uh, the soldiers uh, didn't have any respect uh, concerning human rights. Just, that, that was unfortunately not uh, one of their main interests in that region. So the PKK uprising began, uh, and it is still active in Turkey. Uh, more than 40,000 people died during this up, uh, during this uh, uprisings. And so, uh, another minority was it with, uh, which is actually uh, which has not have any rights regarding to the uh, Treaty of Lausanne are the uh, Alevis. Uh, Alevis uh, are an sectic. Uh, another sect of the religion of Islam. I'm not a, a religious person, so I do not know the differences so very much. Uh, but uh, they do not have the right uh, to uh, build their own prayer uh, houses, not mosques. They have prayer houses, which are called Jemevi and they are denied to have their own uh, uh, prayers, uh, like in the Sunni tradition. The, the Sunni tradition has got their imams, uh, the Alevis have got their uh, dedes, 
the institution of religious affairs in Turkey does only pay salary to the imams, to the Sunni believers, but not to the Alevis. And that's a main problem uh, for the Alevis. Actually, the Alevis um, minority, um, approximately 14 million people uh, have the Alevi faith in Turkey. Uh, I thought at the beginning uh, when the new the republic was established that they would have uh, have now a chance since the newly uh, established republic was actually a secular state and so they thought okay now we are equal uh, because there is no uh, there is no differentiation between a sunni muslim and an alevi muslim uh, but that turned out to be not true since uh, the majority and if you have uh, in Turkey, if you are uh, Sunni, Turk, uh, you have more rights than the other uh, Turks or uh, foreigners, unfortunately. So when it comes to reforms and uh, some recommendations to the Turkish uh, policy, especially uh, after 2002 when, and 2005, uh, in the course of Turkey's EU accession process, European Union's accession process, there were actually uh, significant improvements in individual freedoms and also on minority rights. Uh, for example, uh, new churches were established or built and some of the properties of the church, which was actually confiscated from the state back in the 1930s, were, turned back, uh, were returned back to the uh, churches or the uh, religious uh, groups then, especially in the southeast of Turkey. And there was an improvement, for example, in cultural rights. Uh, as I mentioned before, the Kurdish language uh, was accepted as a teachable language. And uh, the state TV, broadcaster TV, also uh, opened a Kurdish uh, TV channel uh, for the Kurdish-speaking minority in Turkey. But the problem was always, and is still today also, uh, the legislation is there, but the will to implement this legislation from the political side is not there. And it's only uh, in conjectural. Uh, the Turkish government, if, uh, it is, if there is a pressure from the uh, European Union or from uh, the United States, then it is willing to implement these reforms or this implement uh, this uh, freedoms for uh, minorities, especially. Uh, for example, the Kurdish language, uh, the letter X, Q, and W is in the Kurdish letter, but you cannot see any banner. Uh, with, with these letters actually in the Western cities of Turkey because the mayor of the city is putting the, these banners down because they are Kurdish and they provoke, they, uh, the accusation is that they provoke uh, the other citizens in the city. So that, that's the main problem of the Turkish political uh, institutions that there is a lack of uh, willingness to implement these reforms. There are the, refor the reforms are there, they are on the paper, uh, but unfortunately they are not implemented. And so uh, I have to thank you. Uh, I hope that it was uh, short. And if there are further questions, I would like to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, um, Osan al -Berak. So if you have any questions, feel free um, to raise your hand in Zoom to unmute yourself, or you can type your question directly to me or to the speaker and I can read or he can read the question. So if you would like to ask a question, you can unmute, I think, I believe you can unmute yourself or you can raise your hand so that I can 
initiate that. Any questions? Okay, Craig. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this uh, wonderful um, uh, exposition. And I'm wondering, with Turkey not being accepted into the EU and, and, and a kind of a division growing between the EU and Turkey, do you think that there's less hope for some of these reforms? Because as I understood it, and even from, from your address, uh, a lot of the, uh, the movement for reform came from the hope that Turkey would join the European Union and had to enact some of these reforms. That doesn't seem so likely anymore. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you very much for the question, actually. Um, the problem is that um, Turkey, uh, the rhetoric of the Turkish politicians, uh, Erdogan or the previous ones, was always that the European Union is uh, letting Turkey waiting in front of the door. So, and that uh, there is an... Uh, uh, hypocrisy against Turkey when it comes to Turkey's uh, accession to the European Union. And um, these days, for example, although for, uh, just to mention uh, some reforms which are still waiting, um, the rule of law is denied in Turkey, uh, is not happening in Turkey, unfortunately, is uh, neglected in Turkey, although Turkey is a part to and signatory to several agreements. Uh, the there is a strong uh, concern of security uh, with the war ongoing in Syria. The Turks have uh, more security concerns than uh, some for them some uh, human rights issues. So, but on the other hand, there's a vivid and vocal uh, community in Turkey, which is actually seeking for more reforms in Turkey. The power, the democratic powers in Turkey are still functioning. Uh, it is losing an, uh, in power, these democratic uh, forces, but they are there. So, uh, if the European Union wants to have a more democratic uh, Turkey or, uh, or a Turkish government to speak with, it must invest uh, in the society, in the Turkish democratic society in Turkey. Uh, there is a will of these democratic uh, people uh, who, uh, to uh, put pressure on Erdogan and his government to, uh, to implement these rules, uh, to implement these reforms, but they need the society, the Turkish society needs the contribution of the European Union. Um, the process, the European accession, European Union accession process is uh, unfortunately on ice. It, it will not go on. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, the European Union has uh, got some tools in which he, uh, it can uh, support the Turkish society, the democratic society in Turkey. And um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, I worked in the European Union department uh, as I was a junior diplomat in Turkey, in Ankara uh, in 2013. And I know what the minister then said after the report uh, of the European Union, the progress report of the European Union was published for, for us. He meant it's trash. Uh, it's going to into the trash because uh, I do not understand uh, the politicians. I'm not a politician, but uh, for the politicians uh, to uh, be uh, criticized in that way, in the, the European way, is uh, an assault for them and they do not accept it. So the European Union has to go to the Turkish society to uh, promote the democratic uh, 
the struggle of this society against the government, against its own government, on the Turkish government, is more important, I guess. Thank you for the question, Greg, and for your answer. Um, here's a question. Um, you, you talked about that the European Union should go to the society. Can you give a few examples on how that should could be achieved? How could the European Union actually um, address the Turkish society? First of all, there are several tools. Uh, there is the IP. PA mechanism, uh, which actually gives Turkey some funds uh, to uh, reform, to make reforms or to implement some reforms on the civil society uh, spectrum. And uh, the other mechanism is, for example, uh, with uh, Erasmus programs, uh, exchange programs, student exchange program. That's very uh, important. When students came, uh, came to European cities, European countries, they see uh, how a democratic state can function. And when they, come, when they go back to Turkey, of course, they demand this change also for their own, uh, should it be on the societal level or uh, rule of law level. So uh, this has to be enhanced, actually. This has to be broadened. This kind of program has to be broadened. Turkey shouldn't be just only a, a refugee keeper uh, for the European Union. That's the main problem, one of the main problems, because uh, Europe doesn't want the refugees, the Syrian refugees or the Iraqi refugees uh, ca uh, coming to Europe. So it, it is giving some money to Turkey to keep the refugees out of Europe. That, that shouldn't be the only uh, aspect for the European Union to deal with Turkey. And uh, the European Union has also, for example, uh, some mechanisms or tools which it can uh, use uh, since, for example, we as institutions are following very closely uh, torture cases in Turkey. Kurdish, the Kurdish population in the Southeast uh, is tortured or uh, some uh, after the coup attempt in 2016, some Gulenists are tortured and the number of tortured people is extremely high. And unfortunately, there's an impunity culture in Turkish rule of law. When a state official tortures someone, it's normal. You have to accept it in the society, but that's, that's not the case. You can't uh, accept any torture. And there is an impunity, impunity culture in Turkey's legal uh, services, unfortunately. And the European Union has actually a mechanism where it can uh, bring the torturers, uh, the, these perpetrators, into in front of justice with its own human rights uh, sanction regime, for example. It's like the Magnitsky law in the US. It's a newly adopted system, but it can do it. So there are several tools which the European Union can actually use. But uh, for more democratization, I think the exchange between the populations, uh, should it be Erasmus or with programs or with fundings of the civil society or uh, civil society is more important. Thank you. So there's one question here. Um, it's about the Alevis. Why didn't the Alevi population rise up in protest in the same way as the Kurds in the 1980s? Oh, the Alevis actually uh, believed, and they are still believing, uh, that the secularism, which is very, uh, which is also in the constitution, builds still uh, an opportunity for the Alevis to be not uh, assimilated, I'm calling it so. Um, the Alevis actually, uh, are uh, comparing to the Kurdish population uh, are not so much discriminated like the Kurdish. Uh, Alevis uh, are mostly of Turkish ethnic group, 
we can name it so, but there are also some Kurdish Alevis, uh, but the major population of the Alevis are Turkic. So uh, they enjoy almost the same rights as the Turkish majority. So they didn't had, uh, have any uh, much importance to uh, uprise. But uh, saying that and bearing that in mind, we can also say that Alevis also protested for their, or uh, there were also some uh, massacres against the Alevis uh, in Turkey, uh, just only to mention 1993, Sivas, uh, uh, the Madamak uh, Hotel in Sivas, uh, where uh, artists, poets, uh, and uh, um, songwriters of the Alevis uh, were burned by a crowded Sunni Muslim group who called Allahu Akbar and burned the hotel down. Uh, 33 Alevis died during this uh, massacre. And um, after that, it was a uh, call. It was for the Alevis a wake up call. After that, most of the Alevis uh, immigrated to the European nation, to the European Union, and tried to seek for their rights here. And the Alevi, the Alevi community in Europe is much more stronger and. Uh, puts much more importance to its identity here in Europe than in Turkey. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Um, how has Turkey's turn away from the democracy affected its economy? Oh, <laughs> of course, when there is no rule of law, there is no regulation, and when there is no regulation and uh, there is uh, also an economic, uh, it has also an effect on the economy, of course. When uh, one man, um, when there's no check and balances in this Turk current Turkish system, there isn't actually in, in this Turkish presidential, Turkish style presidential system, there are no check and balances like, for example, in the States. Um, uh, just to make comparison, uh, the Trump administration sometimes uh, tried to do make solo movements uh, to take decisions, one-sided decisions, but there was, there was always uh, the jurisdictive uh, or some other institutions who checked him. In Turkey, there is no such mechanism, unfortunately, now. So if the president one day, for example, uh, he decides to make a change in the, uh, of the governor of the uh, central bank. He changes him uh, and there's no stability and there's no continuity in that policy. He changed his uh, macroeconomic policies from day to day. So uh, unfortunately, uh, since there is no counter uh, check and balances which can uh, check him, uh, there is for the investors in, uh, who invest in Turkey, there is no interest in that because they, they are not uh, seeing, they cannot predict the future or, uh, of their investments. So they are uh, pulling out from Turkey all the money. Uh, that unfortunately said is also, for example, the Istanbul Convention, just an example. Istanbul Convention is an agreement, is a convention which actually protects women from domestic violence. And Erdogan, uh, the president Erdogan, without any debate in the parliament or something, or in the uh, media, he uh, withdrew from that uh, agreement. So how can you count on such a president who is not stable actually, and decides from today to tomorrow differently? Thank you. Um... There's one more question. Are there political parties beyond the Kurdish party, the HDP, that also support minority rights? Are they gaining any support in Turkey? Uh, 
there are new parties uh, which actually have a support of uh, the majority but if they if uh, I, I'm not sure because there, these parties actually the newly uh, established parties in Turkey uh, which can make to the part which can make actually to, to win seats at the parliament uh, are uh, ex uh, members of the ruling party of the today's ruling party and the mindset of them uh, is actually they are like-minded with Erdogan There's just only one party, uh, the, um, the Deva party. Uh, not, I do not know which, what is the English of that one. Uh, development and uh, economic party or something like that. Uh, Ali Babajan, he was a former minister under Erdogan, uh, an economic minister. And his uh, statements and his politic uh, and the statement of his uh, uh, party members are actually showing that they are, uh, in a way, uh, willing to make reforms when it comes to minority rights. Um, but you have to, uh, we, we have to understand that, for example, Erdogan, uh, he's an opportunist. Uh, Uh, how did Erdogan became uh, came to power? Because he was a very good mayor in Istanbul, and uh, he did actually uh, recite a poem from Ziya Gökalp. Ziya Gökalp is the main ideologist of Turkishness, of the Turkic consciousness in Turkey, uh, where also Atatürk took his ideas of being a Turk, how to being a Turk. And the state apparatus in Turkey is built on this Turkishness. So these parties after Atatürk, all the main parties, all uh, Atatürk's parties, the uh, Kemalist parties also uh, are following actually the same rules Uh, of the uh, progress, uh, the union of progressive uh, forces in Turkey, the uh, back, back to uh, the founding, the Ittat Veteraki, the Young Turks, the, they are still following the same mentality. You see the essence in that. Uh, the only party in Turkey, really, who are willingly contributing to minority rights. Are, are the HDP, uh, the HDP, which is uh, the left Kurdish uh, party. And another party, uh, there is no another party, I think, in Turkey, who is really keen to uh, promote minority rights in Turkey. Because Thank the you. other parties are from the establishment. I will call it so. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. There's one more question. So you talked about that um, the current, all the political parties follow the ideology basically of the political party that committed the Armenian genocide and committed other crimes. And, and we are still seeing that happening. And we are seeing how Erdogan is establishing his one man rule or already has done that. So do you see any signs of hope here for Turkey in the future? Yes, of course. Well, I have to uh, have this hope, uh, although I'm living abroad <laughs> in exile. Uh, but I have this belief and I do believe in the Turkish society uh, because the Turkish society is not composed just only of Erdoganists or uh, of these young Turks. There are also uh, really... Uh, democratic, uh, especially the young population in Turkey, uh, which sees the world in different eyes, is keen to make changes. But uh, today, uh, in this period of time in Turkey, unfortunately, uh, political pressure on uh, opposition is very, is very harsh in Turkey. 
you are going to jail if you criticize, if you tweet or retweet any critics towards Erdogan. So it's a time, but it cannot, also Erdogan cannot uh, pursue these politics, this kind of politics for um, ever. So there will be a change, uh, hopefully uh, a change within the Turkish society, within Turkey, not from outside. Uh, but from inside Turkey has to be done. And uh, that's very important. And so Western and democratic countries, governments have the opportunity to help these people. And I'm bearing this uh, hope with me. I hope it will come very soon. And I can go to my, uh, I'm loving my country. Uh, I'm loving my people. And I'm trying to, for example, I'm coming from the eastern part of Turkey and my ancestor told me about Armenian villages, but there are no Armenians. And when I asked them, where are these people? Uh, no one could answer. I know the answer now. They were massacred. They, there was a genocide. And I accept this and what will I do? I will pass this knowledge and I will pass uh, this information to my sons. And I hope that uh, they will process and they also will face with their history and to, to erase, uh, unfortunately, since I, I mentioned it, uh, the, the time when the Armenian genocide was perpetrated in Turkey. It was erased from all books in Turkey. You can't find anything uh, during that time in Turkish uh, libraries. And the only critics who do write something are living abroad, unfortunately. And uh, so I still uh, and believer and uh, I have hope in the Turkish society that it will one day um, make a democratic change in Turkey. Thank you. Um, we hope so too, that Turkey will turn one day back, or well, not back, it, I think it has never been a full democracy, but it was a bit more democratic than right now. So one more question, is there a distinct majority ethnic group or are ethnic lines heavily blurred over so many eras of empires? Sorry, I couldn't understand. So is there a distinct majority ethnic group in Turkey or are ethnic lines heavily blurred over so many eras and empires? So ethnically, if you look at the DNA perhaps of Turkish people, would you say there is a certain DNA or is it all over the places of the civilization that lived in that land that is today tur called Turkey? Turkey, actually today's Turkey is a, is a melting pot normally uh, because um, the Ottoman Empire ruled for more than 600 years uh, in this region of the world. So, and it had many diverse nationalities, just only to see it geographically today, more than 30 states are uh, today in the Ottoman uh, geography, empire geography. So, uh, every, for example, if you say that you are pure Turkic ethnicity, there are DNA, DNA tests, uh, and also uh, the registrate of uh, ancestor registrate in Turkey opened several years ago, two years ago, three years ago, and everyone had the chance to look uh, where his ancestors came from. And it was very surprising because you had one nationalist, I had one nationalist friend, he is ultra nationalist, and he said, my ancestors are coming from an Arab region. <laughs> and he was very surprised that he had uh, Arab genes, uh, DNA, DNAs in his, uh, <laughs> so, but the understanding, it's uh, the mentality, it's more nationalist, I think, than the ethnic uh, DNAs. The, and, uh, but the history is told, and so, 
uh, I asked my grandfather where he where actually we are coming from because from the region where we are, it, I can you can follow for example when you look at the weddings or at the uh, in diverse ceremonies, I noticed that we were kind of different from the majority in that region, and so I asked him. Uh, where are we from? Why are we different from this group of people who are living in the same village? And he said that we actually immigrated from the Caucasus region and that we are from Georgia. And several years uh, in my time during as a uh, diplomat, I went to, Ge to Georgia and found my ancestral village there. And I made a DNA test. <laughs> it was very interesting to see uh, that my grandfather actually was right uh, because we had all the line uh, from my father's side was all uh, uh, Georgian, Abhazian, more specific. And from my, my mother's side, I'm more uh, Crimea, uh, Russia, today's Russia, uh, which, which is actually occupied <laughs> now from Russia as well. Uh, one more interesting in Russia, and for example, the ultra nationalist in Turkey today, uh, with the ex uh, with the recognition of Biden, they were of course very angry and said, "Now we are getting more close to Russia." Uh, what they do forget is that Russia recognized the Armenian genocide in the sixties. So uh, it's kind of interesting to follow people who claim that they are nationals and that they are proud of their history and denying the Armenian genocide on the other hand and uh, protesting uh, President Biden's uh, recognition decision and, other, uh, and saying that they are now getting closer and, uh, to Russia, although Russia did the, the recognition of the Armenian genocide several years ago. So uh, unfortunately, that's today's Turkey. I hope it will improve <laughs> in the positive, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's one more question, perhaps the last question, because it, it is right now 1 a.m. in Germany, in Berlin, Germany. So it's late and, um, it, it, and we are in the month of Ramadan. So perhaps you would like to eat uh, <laughs> before you start fasting or so. Drink. drink. Drink or drink water, yes. <laughs> so the last question that I have here in the chat is, as you observe the world, do any lessons or threats stand out for this challenge to democracy and human rights? Other, other strongman systems um, similar or like Putin? Unfortunately, there is a trend of authoritarianism. Uh, we see it in uh, Erdogan is not as... Uh, only example of this uh, tra uh, this kind of uh, leadership. Uh, we in Europe we have got uh, the Hungarian um, state man Orban, or uh, the Polish uh, system is also uh, going backwards. Although these two countries are in the European Union, although there is a good check and balance system in the European Union. Um, Erdogan is one of these leaders who um, is using this uh, rhetoric, this nationalist and this authoritarian rhetoric to consolidate its uh, voters, uh, its own ranks. And you need always uh, an enemy for that, an enemy inside, sometimes an enemy outside. So, but I hope, and uh, what I can see here, for example, in Germany is that uh, there's also in Germany, a national front, which is gaining uh, votes more and more. And we have elections here in Germany in autumn, in September 26th. And it seems that there are, most probably going to uh, have more votes than the previous elections. But there is also a resistance uh, from the population against this tendency, against these trends uh, of alternatism. 
but it is a struggle. Democracy or rule of law or human rights have to be fought for every day. Because once one day, if you are not doing something for more democracy or for more human rights, uh, these other powers uh, or these uh, leaders who are trying to uh, corrupt the system, uh, gain more power. So it's uh, ever uh, continuing struggle for the democracy. We have to do that. We, we as uh, democratics who believe in the democratic value, who believe in uh, universal rights, human rights, we have to do that. And uh, we have to come together and do that because alone you cannot do that. So there should be a coalition of democratic forces against this totalitarian or against these dictators. In a very good way to end this program. And by the way, um, I learned that there is a curfew right now in Germany. After 10 p.m., you cannot go outside. So I'm staying at home. I'm staying at the office, so that's not a problem. Uh, my wife can wait for me. She knows where I am and that I'm not going out anywhere, so it's not a problem. <laughs> so, but uh, with your uh, permission, I would like to. Uh, I have two books which I would like to recommend, especially uh, about uh, for the Turkish listeners. I do have some book. It's from Barış Ünlü. It's called Türklük Sözleşmesi. It explains, actually, I do not know if there, if, this, uh, if we have got in English, but uh, if we should have it, I'm going to uh, give it to you, uh, Ismail, so you can recommend this book as well. And it explains how the Turkish nation was built actually during this time, uh, during the first years uh, the Turkish understanding. Uh, and of course, coming uh, to the Armenian genocide and the ethnic cleansing, uh, an esteemed and distinguished professor, uh, Taner Akçam, uh, his books are in English, uh, The Young Turks, Crime Against Humanity, uh, The Armenian Genocide and Ethnic Cleansing in the Ottoman Empire. And it's such a book, but he also announced that there will be a summary of his writings concerning the Armenian genocide, and it will be published very soon, I think. So uh, I hope also uh, yeah, the Young Turks, yes. Uh, and these uh, this books are very, very good and summarized uh, and uh, to, uh, who wants to ent uh, understand this period of the time and why the Turks are denying uh, the genocide. Uh, it will be very interesting for them to read this and give an uh, understanding of the whole picture. Uh, and so. Wonderful, thank you. I actually found both books of, on Amazon. I put them into the chat, um, the Turkish book and um, the book by Taner Akcam on the Young Turks Crime Against Humanity. So if you're interested, you can click on that link um, to see uh, the book or purchase the book. So along with that, many, many thanks to Germany, to Berlin, um, to our speaker. Um, yeah. Yeah, we, it's going to be late for you. He's going to sleep in his office this evening just for us. So please help me thanking our speaker for um, this great talk and this discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your evening um, in, in Colorado and hope to see everybody soon then for our event on May 23rd. Take care. Good night.